All right, hello all. Just getting you set up here. Um, it looks like we have all our participants in, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, let me just check the chat, make sure you're all hearing me. Okay, uh, let me know if you guys can hear me in the chat real quick. Perfect, as long as a couple of people can hear me and know it's okay on our end. All right. Okay, guys, uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, we have um, a guest here, Dr. Scott Ferguson. I'll be introducing him shortly. Uh, the way I want to get started off is to uh, give you a bit of a rundown of the webinar and how it works. Uh, we do have this webinar monthly. Uh, we've been a bit delayed recently um, with some of the issues going on worldwide, particularly in China right now. Um, so we're very happy to finally be getting back to it a little bit late in the month here. Um, so for this uh, webinar that we have uh, this week, we're looking at interviewing and landing a faculty position. Um, I'm actually gonna bring in Dr. Ferguson real quick. I'm gonna unmute him. And Scott, you can start your video. Hey folks. So this is Dr. Scott Ferguson. Um, Scott and I are actually know, uh, know one another. Um, he's been a colleague for quite a while and I count him as one of my good friends. Um, I asked him to be here today because I think um, I can trust him to speak candidly to you about this topic, which is something I don't think you always get. Um, there's a lot of diplomacy that goes on um, with uh, faculty positions and hiring. Um, Scott is a relatively open, honest guy, and so I think he is going to give you um, his frank perspective on this issue, which I think is needed, um, particularly for young, um, early career, um, first-time faculty members. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for the webinar controls, um, all you guys need to know is you're going to follow along. We have a PowerPoint that's up. Uh, Scott and I will be talking through some of the issues that we've laid out here. Um, you do have the chat feature, which is where you can go back and forth a little bit, particularly if we have a technical issue or anything. Um, we do have Dr. Abriel Lachardi um, from LetPub. She is um, not going to be live with us today, but she is in the chat. So if there's any issues, she should be able to help you out there. Um, otherwise, it's going to be myself and Dr. Ferguson. Um, what you can do for questions. So if you put questions into the chat, um, AB is going to encourage you to move them over to the Q&A function. So if you look, there is a Q&A option um, where you can um, enter your question, and what you can also do is upvote questions. Uh, what we'd encourage you to do is take a look at the available questions that are there. If you have a similar or the same question, go ahead and upvote it. When we get to the end, usually with this number of people, it looks like we're approaching 60 attendees. Um, we do get quite a few questions. Um, in that regard, it helps us to work through them if you guys can rank the questions. So be sure to go ahead and give a like to any question that you want to move to the top of the list and we'll go through it in that order. Um, again, if you do put a question in chat, we're not going to go there to look for it. So just make sure you copy it over um, to the Q&A function. That way we can get to it. Um, feel free to put questions in during the presentation because uh, what happens is we get towards the end and there's sort of a scramble for you to put your um, uh, questions in there. Um, another thing that often happens, you guys know going to conferences, you sit through an entire presentation. By the time you get to the end of the presentation, you don't quite have the same formulated question. Um, you don't recall exactly what you wanted to address. So feel free to add those um, during the discussion. We're not going to get to them. We're not going to stop during it. But by the time we get to the end, we'll have a nice list there to go through. And I'm sure there will be several questions uh, given this topic. Um, so like I said, uh, my name is Dr. Clark Holdsworth. I'm uh, the Research Communications Manager at LetPub. I'm going to let Dr. Ferguson do his own introduction here. So you can take it away, Scott. All right, thanks, Clark. Well, hey, folks, yeah, uh, happy to be here. Uh, my name's Scott Ferguson. I'm uh, currently on faculty at the University of Hawaii uh, in Hilo. Uh, we've got 10 campuses. I'm on the uh, Big Island. Um, of Hawaii as in a small town called Hilo. Um, Clark already mentioned uh, that we know each other 
previously, we went to graduate school together, actually, at uh, Kansas State University, uh, trained, trained under the same mentors in cardiopulmonary physiology, um, looking at uh, some impacts of different therapeutics uh, in heart failure, primarily. So a couple different models of, of heart failure, uh, animal models, and then finished up at Kansas State, um, would have been 2015, uh, 2015 and graduated, went to a postdoctoral fellowship. I did about four years uh, uh, as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, um, cardiopulmonary and vascular uh, research laboratory there. Um, had an opportunity to do some really amazing work there, uh, both preclinical and clinical. The picture you see in the middle is me participating in a clinical exercise study looking at the effects of left ventricular uh, assist devices or LVADs. Um, on exercise tolerance um, and heart failure patients. And those devices are really neat because those, the, the patients actually don't have a pulse, right? So if they have these LVADs um, installed, implanted on their heart, they, they don't have any pulsatile blood flow. So we were uh, looking at the, the changes in autonomic function and ultimately exercise tolerance. And I got to serve as one of the healthy controls in that study. Um, so really great opportunities to do some work there. And, and that final picture on the right, there is a picture I took with my uh, good friend and colleague who also trained with Clark and I, uh, Daniel Harai, who's, who's on faculty at, at uh, University of Purdue, uh, recently transitioned to faculty position there as well. Um, so he came to visit there in Colorado and we snapped that picture. That was right before I moved to University of Hawaii um, in July, just this last year. So one semester under the belt, um, I currently teach, um, I do three classes, three three credit hour classes, uh, teach cardiopulmonary physiology uh, in a care and prevention of athletic injuries course. Um, I'm actually on only two of those courses right now because I've got a course for, um, for research, but we'll probably talk a little bit about some of those details a little bit later on. Um, so with that being said, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Perfect. Yeah, I asked uh, Scott to give a little bit of his background because I think a topic that we're going to end up covering here today um, is being able to share your science and engage with the people that you meet during your interview sessions. Um, in particular, you end up doing some of that, uh, I think Scott will attest to, with people who are not in your area. So you do end up meeting a lot of people at the university who really don't have anything to do with your research area, and you still need to be able to speak with them and engage with them. Um, as a scientist. And so this audience is that type of situation, but um, that's going to be a theme that I think will come up, um, being able to talk about your research in that way, which Scott is very comfortable doing because he's obviously uh, passionate about the topics that he works on. Um, so to get started, so this is a, a rough overview of how we're going to sort of structure this back and forth uh, between Scott and myself. Um, the way we'll start out is with a timeline and stages for the academic job search. So we're going to lay it out. Um, it's a bit difficult, I think, right, because it's relatively linear. And so we can lay it out in um, a linear organization for this presentation because that's how you end up tackling it. However, we're going to have to go back and forth on uh, some topics because certain things don't work out in a step-by-step -step process and you have to go back. Um, and revisit or do um, some of your tasks may overlap. Um, but this, this timeline way, this linear flow allows us to sort of organize our discussion here. We'll then move on to, uh, I think, one of the keys, prepping and research. Um, I'm sure Scott has a lot to offer in that regard. Um, not only his own experience, but what he's heard from others. So what his mentors, his colleagues have discussed with him in terms of their experiences, what you need to do to prep for these sort of interview sessions that you're going to be going to, prepping for your talk, that type of content. Uh, then we'll move on to meetings, um, engagement, and expectation setting. Um, when you're going in, both you trying to set expe expectations um, for the potential um, employer, um, and then trying to set expectations for you and how you're going to respond to that. Then we'll move into the job talk. Um, this is kind of going to be some of the softer stuff, things that are a little bit more subjective, a little bit more nuanced, and this is where I think we're really going to be drawing on Scott's recent experience. Um, I'm interested to hear how he dealt with some of these because I don't think that there's really any textbook strategy 
Um, so we'll hear from Scott a little bit about some of those topics. We'll get into negotiation tips. This is going to vary. Um, so Scott's just going to um, share his experience with you in this regard. But negotiation, um, this type of thing is going to vary from field to field, from department to department, from university to university, because it's dependent on size, geographical location, structure, um, all sorts of things that no one individual would have experience with. And then finally, of course, we'll move on uh, to the Q&A here. So the general idea for this, what we want to focus on is you've already got the invitation for the interview. This next slide we're going to go into, we will talk about that, um, those initial stages, the pre-selection um, stages, so getting your applications in and getting invited. But generally what we want to focus on here is you've got the in-person interview, now you've got to prep yourself. So in that regard, these are the timelines and stages for the academic job search. Um, as we mentioned here, you have pre-application um, where you're trying to assess your career goals. What's going to be a fit? Is Hawaii going to be a fit for you? Which Scott obviously gave the okay to. Um, you're going to look at your own personal research productivity to determine sort of what role you're ready for. Um, which level of faculty are you going to be looking to move into? Um, discussion with your mentors, I think this is crucial, and I'm sure Scott is going to share some of his insight on that. Um, your attendance at conferences in order to network and sort of identify what opportunities there may be, because there is a very, very strong networking component within academia. Uh, then there's the application, your CV, research statement, teaching statement, recommendation letters. Um, the shortlisting, sort of the pre-interview type thing, which I'm keen to hear from Scott on. Um, and then, of course, we'll move into the interview. So I want to start here, Scott, with the, the um, pre-application. So sort of just mentioned it. Um, what, what were you thinking and what sort of checklist did you give yourself for um, possible university targets? And in particular, how did it actually work out for you um, to apply to um, your current university? Um, I had had my ear to the ground, I guess. So I've been looking for uh, faculty opportunities um, for about, I don't know, after about a year, I got into postdoc. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people recommend two to four years with the postdoc training in my field. I know it's different for other folks. Um, but yeah, so I had sort of been looking around, uh, applied to a couple other positions, uh, use, I signed up to a few, uh, search engines like higher ed uh, jobs.com I think is, is what it was uh, but you can select based on your discipline and they'll send you a list of, of uh, you know institutions that are that are offering positions okay. and so I get I would get those emails every day um, or just about every other day I think they come through every few days and just flip through to see what's there and occasionally one would pique my interest and that's how I found this one. Um, so I clicked on it, read what they were looking for. For me, um, at the time, I was at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Uh, like I mentioned, about a third year postdoc at that point. Just submitted a bunch of grants, um, waiting to hear back for some, from some of those. And yeah, at that point, like looking forward to the next step, um, ready to transition to faculty position, ready to to be an independent investigator, which was sort of the first point on my checklist is I want to do my own research, um, have my own lab, mentor my own students, um, and that, you know, pursue my own research questions. So as far as a checklist is concerned, that was a major component. Um, the second would be uh, teaching. I really enjoy teaching, which I kind of mentioned in the first point anyway, is mentoring students. I didn't get to do any teaching at the School of Medicine. I did, uh, I lectured to the department several times throughout the semester, but it's a bit different uh, when you're, you know, uh, lecturing to undergraduates and, and early graduate students. So um, I did miss that. So that was another part that I was hoping to find. Um, and so that fit the bill with the University of Hawaii. And then also you got to find somewhere that you want to live, right? That's your, that's, that fits your lifestyle, um, that you're not going to be miserable at um, if you if you do end up moving there because you'll live. so um, that's that's pretty much the goals that I had looked for um, you know I, I I needed to identify then can I do my work there 
Um, and, you know, in the short term, I had to send out emails. And really what I did is I just inquired about the position. I said, hey, I do this kind of work. Here's my CV. Um, do you think this is something that uh, you're someone you'd, you'd like to work with or would be interested or a good applicant for the job? And, you know, received positive appraisal. And, you know, they, they were recommending me that I submit a full application. So that's how that pre-application okay. process went. Perfect. So, so you would advise reaching out um, sometimes in an informal way, like we talked about in terms of networking like that to, to get an, a little bit of insight or like, am I the candidate that you want in your pool, that you want in your pre-list pool um, before even bothering to send it in? Because it is a lot of work, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, everything adjusted. So that's a good, a good first step. There's sort of a pre-pre-application. Yeah, for sure. Where you reach out a bit informally to someone um, at the university to get an idea of if you fit the mold at all before you go ahead with the process. Yeah, and honestly, uh, I'll emphasize that even more because every, I went back and I looked like, honestly, every good thing that's happened in my career and every transition point, uh, and that includes getting into graduate school, uh, it all happened from reaching out and formally via email and just asking about a position or asking about an opportunity and that's what happened um like i mentioned i got into graduate school and then again when i found my postdoctoral fellowship uh, i didn't actually know the mentors that i ended up working with at the time i established a uh, relationship with them just by reaching out and said hey i do this uh, i see that you do this can we work together and uh same with the faculty position so i'll, I'll say don't be shy clicking on that contact link and just send them an email throw your cv on there Perfect. Um, I, I think it's doubly important for probably a lot of people with our audience here today. So um, it's hard enough for someone like yourself, um, a well-spoken, amicable guy, to reach out in that way. There's a sort of hesitancy. Um, you're not comfortable. They're not confident with it. I think everybody has a little bit of that to a degree. It's even harder if, um, say, that there's cultural differences, if um, English isn't your primary language, this type of thing. So um, I know from my perspective, I think you'd agree from your perspective, if you ever get a call from someone or someone reaching out an email, there's no judgment on that end. I, I would encourage people to do it. Don't let language or anything be a barrier. Um, reaching out informally like that is never going to be regarded poorly by whoever's on the receiving end, particularly in academia. People are interested in that. Um, so definitely, I know it it's hard enough for someone like you. It can be even harder for um, someone who English is not their primary language, but you just have to do it. Be confident that the person on the receiving end um, is going to be receptive to you reaching out to them. And if they're not, that's maybe a person you don't want to associate yeah, with. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I was going to say. Just go ahead. Yeah, use it as a litmus test. Mm -hmm. So it gives you some information about it. If you're reaching out to someone in the department and they're not receptive, maybe that's somewhere you don't want to be anyway. Okay, great. That's perfect. Um, application wise, I'm curious about, um, is there anything that you did different? Um, so going on from a postdoc position and of course you're updating your CV, right? You're making sure your CV is perfect. That goes without saying going in and having it maybe checked over by someone else. Again, particularly if English isn't your primary language and you got to translate it. Um, but is there anything different you did? Is there anything that you need, you felt you needed to include? Um, now going to faculty applications versus when you were looking for a postdoc position? Yeah, so you you really want to make sure you do your research on the, uh, on the on the institution and the faculty that you'll be working with at, at this point. So uh, for me, I okay, I'd identified I'll, I'll apply. Uh, to the University of Hawaii. So I, at that point, I'd already identified one person I might be able to work with, um, the guy that I had interacted with via email. So, and it, so I, I dove into his work a little bit, uh, but then I also looked at other folks in the department to try to get an idea of what they do, what the goals of the department are. Um, and then I tailored my cover letter, which is a key component of your application to uh, suggest or to show that that I'm willing to work with other folks in the department and that I would be an asset um, to what they already have going uh, for them. So it helped build the department, you know, got some goals maybe that, that you got um, that were 
make sure that they're in line with the department. Um, so that's what I would say probably be a key key feature of a, of a faculty proposal is, yeah, you want to make sure that your cover letter is on point with some specific that institution, um, yeah. department even. Um, so what else then? The, uh, yeah, your research statement, same thing, right? So make sure that, that um, you know, what you're sending them is going to be in line with, with their mission. And, and again, if it's not, then maybe that's, you know, a, a sign already that you should be applying elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, teaching statement, same thing there. Um, and then recommendation letters too. I would make sure you pick your recommenders um, or, you know, your people that recommend you carefully, depending on the position, and then talk to them about the position before they put the, or draft their letter. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, coming from big medical school at the University of Colorado to a smaller University of Hawaii Hilo campus where research is not nearly uh, as, as uh, important, I guess you could say, or uh, emphasized for tenure and promotion as it is in the medical school, uh, they can hit on some other attributes that you'll be a little bit more, show you're a little bit more well-rounded. You're not just somebody that's coming with 100% research and you all you can't teach. So those are some things I would recommend. Okay. Excellent. Um, yeah, we're going to talk, I think we're going to cover um, in the interview, you know, aligning yourself with departmental goals, university goals, um, research aims, all that type of stuff. But okay. like you said, it's important to do that right from the very, very beginning to sort of set that tone early on because that's going to carry through. Um, and it sounds to me like um, each of those items, because we already do cover letters, right? You're doing cover letters for manuscripts, um, for any position you've applied to up until now. Um, you're also, of course, doing research statement, teaching summary, these types of things. But what I'm getting from you is that you really went back and everything's a level up when you're going for a faculty position. So before it might have been okay to just tell someone you're going to put them as a, um, a recommendation or ask them to do a letter of recommendation, and that's it. You kind of just let them go. But you're talking about really making sure that you have a discussion with them leading up to it, that you go to your research statement and you make it probably more comprehensive than what your research statement would be as, as a postdoc, where you're a little bit more narrowly focused. So it seems like all those uh, relatively formal aspects of the application, you went sort of above and beyond, took a little bit of an extra step with each one of those um, relative to maybe previous applications. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a great thing. I think pe people definitely need to hear that because we sort of know it's important, but we also get tired of doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is that type of thing. So yeah, this is, this is one part where it's definitely elevated. It sounds like. Um, to yeah. Me, so. Perfect. Uh, let's move on from here because what we're going to be getting into now um, is moving past these early stages to what we saw on the last slide where it's okay. Congrats. You, you've been invited to come out. Um, now is the time to sell yourself. So we'll get into um, the interviews and what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this presentation. Okay, so prepping and research. Um, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say on this because this is something I think you're pretty good at. And so I'm sure you have some really good tips in this regard. Um, so mastering the interview um, with your preparation, you'd think all scientists would be good at it, right? Uh, you're getting ready for it. Um, I think a lot of scientists default that, well, I've given presentations before, so it should just be the same thing. But I'm interested to hear if you found any of the nuances are different. We're going to start with some boring stuff, but I think it's important, um, and I'd like to get your take on it. Uh, this is regarding, like, so you've gotten a letter, and they invite you out. From that to actually getting on the plane and going out there, what were some important things that you were concerned about doing correctly, um, or that you think helped you in this planning stage, whether it's correspondence with the office people, setting up travel arrangements, um, terms of tone, phrasing, what are you focusing on um, as sort of norms in those email exchanges? Yeah, so right off the bat, so essentially what happened with me is I got uh, a video, I get invited to do a, like a Skype interview, um, which is similar to the format we're doing now. 
uh, with the department. So I did that. That went well. And then, yeah, you got, I got invited to an in-person interview, which is a little over a year ago. And uh, immediately you're put in contact with um, a, someone in the administration that uh, is a support person that will help get your travel arrangements squared away. And these people, most times, are going to be people that if you land the job, you're going to be working with immediately and often. Um, so it, it can already be a way to set you up for success if, if you have good interactions with these uh, individuals. Um, you know, you're as helpful as you can be with getting your travel arrangements booked uh, or helping them book them, depending on how that works out for me. Uh, I had to, you know, suggest some dates that would work and then uh, they fired back with different times for flights and then all the booking was taken care of. Um, and same with the hotel. I think I had to front a little bit of cost of the hotel, but you'll work with those individuals uh, right off the bat. And again, yeah, I mean, I still see our, our admin person just about every day. Uh, she helps run our department and does, do a lot, does a lot of work for the college. Uh, so yeah, you want to make a good impression with them right off the bat. They're interview, interviewing you as well. So you want them on your side. Um, so, you know, professional tone, help them, you know, let them know that you're not going to be too terribly difficult to work with. Um, try to be helpful for them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think people underestimate that. You and I know how that is. Um, I think we are sort of the types that put that into high regard, how you treat everybody throughout an organization that you're potentially approaching. Um, and you will find that I think a lot of departments, um, you could be abrasive to a senior scientist in that department and it might be okay, but if you're abrasive with um, someone organizing your travel, some of these um, clerical, these office people that sort of make the department go round, um, they'll take great offense. The, the, the rest of the faculty, they'll be, they'll be more ticked uh, to hear that you're abrasive with them than, than some, you know, big shot faculty member. So it is a good approach to make sure you're cordial with them. Um, what about asking for what you need? So for you, um, you, you had quite a ways to go for your interview. Um, yours is an example of, and some people may be able to relate to it when they're talking about maybe coming to the U.S. to interview when you're looking at international travel. Um, is there any concerns about um, needing to ask for different flights or like a day in advance? Uh, would you warn against anything? Like they, sometimes they might be good. The person arranging stuff might just give you dates and they know um, they have good expectations. They know how much time you need, what's not going to leave you crammed. But other times they're not faculty. They've never interviewed. They've never had to come in and give a talk for an interview process or give a teaching demo. Um, so maybe they, they think it's fine if you fly out the morning that you have to give your talk or something. Um, is it okay for our viewers to ask for an additional day on the front end or the back end um, to make those logistics work for them? Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly what I did. So for me, I was flying from Denver, Colorado to, to Hilo, Hawaii. Um, and, you know, that's a four hour time difference, different hour time zone difference during the summer three hours uh during the winter because we don't go on daylight savings time but uh, yeah it's a long way and again you're you're potentially going to be moving both yourself and your family to this new place um, and i had never been to, to, to the state of life um, not even for a visit or anything like that so in addition to wanting to put yourself in the best position for the interview you want to be rested you know, squared away as far as the time difference are. You don't want to be really jet lagged out, so your, you know, your body's messed up in that regard. Uh, you want to have some extra time. So for me, I flew in Tuesday, Tuesday, full day of travel. So I was exhausted. I got in local time about 5:30. Pretty much hit the hotel and ate some dinner. Went to sleep. Had all day Wednesday to to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, the interview day was Thursday. That's I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little more detail later, but that's a long day mm -hmm. uh, into the evening uh, with dinner. And then, yeah, I mean, until late. And then, yeah, then I had another day on the back end on Friday that I left Saturday. I had to negotiate or ask for those extra days of travel. And I asked, don't feel bad about asking for those extra days in the hotel, 
uh, extra days of car rental, whatever you need to get around. Uh, they can always tell you no. So they didn't, got the, the, the university I'm at now did not cover the extra days in the hotel. So I think I got two nights covered. So they allowed me to come the day before and then leave the day after. I covered a few nights in the hotel surrounding the interview day. Uh, but I think I had two days myself I had to pay for, which I was fine with because I wanted to research the area and see if it was legitimately somewhere I would want to live with my, my family. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would say is don't be afraid to ask for that those as extra bit of time because it's invaluable. I mean, you, you've you got to have it uh, to make up your make a decision. Yeah, definitely ask. I, I don't think it ever reflects poorly. Um, they expect it right? Like they're going through this entire process. They want it to go as well as possible. And quite mm-hmm. often, if there is something logistically that you don't, you're not comfortable with, it, they usually don't even know, right? So like they've set it up and then you ask and they go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like you want to have more prep time for your, your interview. You're flying six time zones <laughs> to get yeah. here. Um, so a lot of times it's just, it's just ignorance on it. They didn't even realize it was an issue. So always ask. It's just like what we were talking about before, reaching out. It's never going to re- reflect poorly. You're you're potentially going to be negotiating, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars in startup money. Like if you can't negotiate an extra hotel night or whatever, if you're not comfortable with that, it's going to be it's going to be tough when it comes to negotiating larger issues. So that's something they're not even really thinking about. So ask. Don't make it. Don't allow it to be a burden on you when it doesn't need to be. If you could just ask and get it resolved, but plan it because it's a whole trip. There's a lot to do usually in these. Um, it's not as simple as coming out, catching a show and flying home, right? You're going out for lengthy interviews. You're going out to talk to basically an entire department, give a presentation, potential teaching demo, all this type of stuff. So definitely ask for it. Um, so I think that covers our logistics here. We're gonna get into the meat now. Um, in terms of looking at the department, so just you can just use your, uh, your experience as an example. So, what did you do? What was your approach? What did other people suggest to you to know before going? And you can touch on any of these points if you want, or go off on your own. Um. So obviously, you want to know who's in the department that you're going to be working with, uh, who's at the different levels, what they've accomplished. Uh, so I'm looking, or what I looked at is, okay, who's who's at the assistant professor level? Who's going to be at my level as well? What are they doing or what have they done? So I'm looking at their, you know, uh, research performance uh, and trying to dig into any types of uh, work that they've done. Um, and then associate pr- professor level, I've looked at, you know, who's got tenure, what type of accomplishments they have. Um, and that kind of gives you an idea of, of already how the university or the college uh, sort of scores you, right? Um, when it comes time for tenure and promotion, that's something that you want to make sure that uh, you're on the right side of, that you're giving yourself the best advantage. So, yeah, I, I dug immediately into the, the faculty in the department. Um, depending on how the, the interviews laid up, you'll typically – you'll be typically given a list of people you're going to meet with. Um, and it's, for me, it was a mix of, of all of the faculty in the department, which at the time there was only four. Um, so we, we hired two at the same time I got hired. So me and uh, myself and one other guy got hired. So we ended up with six. So that didn't take long to meet with them. Um, but so I also ended up meeting with the vice chancellor of academic affairs and the dean of the college of natural and health sciences, which is the college that, that uh, our department's located in. So um, those are people that I also looked up and, and uh, had some questions ready for them. Um, uh, so yeah, you're also looking at institution-wide faculty. So, um, you know, our buildup is a bit different uh, than other institutions because we have 10 campuses. Um, University of Hawaii is spread across all the islands. So, um, you know, we have a chancellor for UH Hilo only, which incidentally, they were hiring at the same time for that. Um, so, yeah, you kind of want to understand how the hierarchy works there. Um, and again, you want to make sure that they have the infrastructure there, identify uh, places in the uh, facility that you want to see. So, for example, if you need laboratory space, ask them to see what type of laboratory space you would be able to use. Um, 
if you were, you know, to, to land the job. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. You also want to come up with the budget idea, things, things that, you know, you're going to need to get your research going, um, that, you know, think about what it would take to get through a whole project that you normally do. Do you have all that equipment? How much does that stuff cost? So you have a number going into your head or going into that interview that's, you know, you can discuss with the administrators. Okay, perfect. So you set up, specific, you added, made sure there were specific things on the itinerary, like tours that you wanted to see, the facilities. Um, you expect, I think, to see that type of thing, that someone's going to show it to you. Um, but maybe that expectation doesn't always get met, right? You sort of take it for granted. It's just like like I was mentioning with the front office people. Um, that maybe they don't predict what you want to see. And so if there's something that's not in your itinerary, you just go ahead and ask for it and make sure you get to see what you're looking to see. Um, in terms of looking at any suggestions when they're looking at the department or college for trying to wrap your head around size, budget, anything like this, was there any materials that you went to, any, anything from this website that you utilized or any direct questions that you, that you asked before coming out? Um, yeah, I had, kind of, I had interacted. So, so the first person I emailed uh, was the former department chair. Uh, I told you I reached out to him and just said, hey, I, you know, I do this work. Or, do you think we could, do you think I should submit a proposal? He forwarded my email to uh, Dr. Link Gottschalk, who's a physiologist here, mus musculoskeletal physiologist in the department. And so I formed a sort of email correspondence with him. Um, and so when I arrived here, uh, the, the, did the for the day of the interview, I had questions ready for him. You know, okay. these students are in the in the department. How, what's enrollment? Is it on? Has it been climbing? Has it been falling? And so these are things you kind of want to gauge on the success of the of the department. How it has funding been for the department from the college in the past? Um, you know, you want to make sure that your, your department is receiving fair play when it comes to representation on committees. Uh, uh, committees are very important um, as well, of course, financial support um, to get things done. So, yeah, these are all pertinent questions to ask your uh, department head and any of the, the senior faculty. Um, a lot of these folks that are full professors were department heads or department chairs at some point. Um, so they'll have a pretty good idea of the lay of the so, land. Gotcha. So your research allowed you to sort of figure out what you didn't know to ask about when you got there. So, so some of the prep work that you did showed you things, uh, led you to some of the questions that you had ready when you actually went out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got to be, be prepped, ready to go for that. Okay. Well, um, I don't want to. I want to make sure we move steadily so we can get through to questions. So. Um, we actually talked about this in the first one, so I'm actually going to skip over this, talking about the itinerary and what you went through. Um, the meetings, one thing I did have a question with the meetings, so um, any suggestions for dealing with all-day meetings where you're meeting with every single faculty member, um, they're asking you various questions, um, and then also with students, did you meet with any grad students or anything, and what sort of what sort of things were you looking to share with both students and faculty to encourage them that there's low risk with hiring you, meaning concerns they might have about your fit and everything, um, and also demonstrating that you align with the research goals of the department and sort of the interpersonal um, structure of the department, their, their own norms for their, their um, social aspect of the department. Yeah, so the it's a long day. Um, the interview, as I mentioned, is a very long day. So coffee, that's kind of what I was smiling earlier. Like you're gonna want to make sure you have some coffee for the day if that's that's what you, if you like. But um, it's yeah, there's a lot of meetings. Um, what I can say is uh, you'll want to, depending on the interview, you usually give a lecture. For me, I lectured to the students as well as the committee, the search committee. So I had about 100 people in my uh, lecture for that. It was a larger lecture. It's the biggest class that our department has. Um, enrollment's like 90, and then there was, yeah, there's there was five people on the committee. So it was close to 100 people in there. Um, so I had, the, one of the key things that the committee was, was concerned about was my ability to teach. So I have, I had a, 
strong CV, uh, a strong set of publications. I've been to I was coming from a major research institute or institution. Uh, and so I have that going for me. Uh, but again, they, they want to make sure that you can teach. So I had to give a presentation over my work and it was to undergraduates. So um, I had to make it very clear that I could communicate my science and educate the students um, and keep them engaged. And for me, that allowed me to feel out how the student body is um, with regards to their interest, uh, you know, how approachable they are, um, how I could get them to interact, which gives me a better idea of if I'm going to enjoy teaching them full time. Uh, right. So those are some of the, the main concepts that I wanted to make sure I focused on um, for the day itself. Uh, Matt helped me align with the department university goals because mm -hmm. again, there's a lot of teaching emphasis here. Yeah, that sounds like a good opportunity. So do you think that helped you to, by presenting to, all, to everybody, these combined groups, um, do you think it helped you in, in terms of being able to sort of live demonstrate to the faculty how you interact and engage with their students and sort of vice versa with the students, how you, how you fit in and assume the role uh, sort of a, of a faculty member during your visit? Would you, would you try to, would you encourage candidates to try to get into these situations where they have both students and faculty either in meetings with them or like for your example, where you're actually doing that, the teaching demo or the talk that was required of you? Is that something you'd, yeah. you, you'd encourage people to ask to have that? Yeah, it depends on the scenario for you. So um, absolutely, for me, it worked out. They just did it without me asking. But I knew going in that uh, my teaching uh, experience and my ability to teach was going to be heavily scrutinized. So uh, yeah, that's something that I would recommend. Uh, again, it depends, right? So my presentation style for that talk, even though many of the slides were similar, Mm -hmm. to uh, what I would give at the medical school. I had a very different approach uh, when it came to describing the, the take home messages for each slide. Mm -hmm. um, so and depending on your, you know, on your work, you, you will need to temper and, and modify your presentation style as well as the content um, for that audience. Now, if you're more research heavy, let's say you're, you're going to an R1 uh, institution, like, like a medical school, where you are 100% research, then obviously, yeah, gear your science to be uh, communicated to scientists, right? Okay. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Perfect. Excellent. Um, let's move on. Um, you talked about this. Um, so you just touched on it perfectly, um, teaching versus research potential. So your opinion is figure out what they want so that you know what has to be highlighted. For you, you come from a very strong research background and it sounds like part of your preparation and then your actual execution of the job talk, um, the lecture that you had to give, was skewed towards a teaching lecture versus the type of lec um, presentation you give at a symposium at a conference or something um, to all scientists. So um, yeah, it sounds like it's very important to figure out what their emphasis is, uh, what the position is really geared on so that you can determine um, what distribution you need to emphasize teaching potential versus research potential. Uh, what about collegiality? So can you talk a little bit more about the interpersonal skills, um, examples of where you felt like you were getting good engagement with the faculty during your trip, whether it's in one-on-one -on -one meetings, after the talk you gave, anything like that? Yeah, I got great engagement. We went to dinner um, that evening. And uh, not everybody was able to, to attend but um, because of prior engagements. But yeah, yeah, that was nice. You know, that's, that was a, uh, definitely a high point of the, the day. A, you're, you're kind of done with a lot of the, the, the bulk of the interview itself. Uh, but being kind of allows people to relax a little bit. Um, you know, it's a little bit more relaxed personal setting. Um, it's evening, and so, yeah, then you can ask a little bit more candid questions with regards to the environment that you're going to be living in, the town, you know, that's when I was getting questions out of the way, like, you know, where do you go to the store and things like that, you know, to 
gives yeah. your food like you know basic questions that um, you know you didn't have a chance to to answer or maybe weren't prioritized earlier in the mm-hmm. day. Um, so that was really good. Uh, students, you know, I got a chance to uh, interact with a few students one on one, which is nice too because you can get an idea. We don't have a graduate. Uh, program for our department of kinesiology right now so i didn't get to interact with any graduate students but the undergraduates i I chatted with they're involved with research um so that was helpful and you know faculty are asking about that right so (laughs) you know the faculty is asking the students how'd your chat with dr ferguson yeah oh yeah 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 and i know (laughs) i went down so yeah. I got told you, Dr. Gottschalk, who I'd reached out early with, he, he told me, he's like, oh, the students loved you, you know, so um, it worked out afterwards there, definitely um, having that chat, because he went and taught class right afterwards with many of those students that were in that lecture, so it was a good way, that lecture was a great way to sort of dispel any any thoughts that, because I do research, I can't teach, so right. set that up if you can. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and like you said, like asking the question, it's not just for you, even if you don't care. So, so for any of our viewers that think, well, I don't care. Like I, I'm, I want to go to the best place for the job. I'm not super concerned about my fit. Still ask the questions, ask the questions like, um, what sort of activities are there? What sort of recreational opportunities are there? Ask, ask questions about lifestyle and the area and everything, because it, that's a part of de-emphasizing that risk sort of deal. Even if you don't care, it gives the in indication to the people that you're talking to, to the hiring committee, that you are concerned about, that you're thinking, am I going to be a good fit here? Am I going to be here long term? Because they might be worried. Like, I don't think he's thinking about whether he actually likes it here. And we're worried that if he's not thinking about that, what if he decides he doesn't like it after six months and leaves, right? So always ask those questions. It suggests, it, I think it makes the committee more comfortable with their sort of risk assessment of you, of whether you're considering um, if the position is the right fit for you, um, yeah. both, both the position at the university itself and in terms of living there and being part of the community. So. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'll say too that it, culturally, that's huge particularly for here at the University of Hawaii, where we live in Hawaii. I mean, the, the temperatures, I mean, it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside. It's beautiful and sunny. So people are outside all the time and outdoor activities is huge. So by asking about the, that type of lifestyle, uh, that's, that's making sure that you're going to align with their culture and that their culture is going to align with you. So again, it's all part of the fit. Um, and you want to have uh, everything else outside of work aside, you want to align with the people that you're working with uh, because it will make your life much more productive. Absolutely. I think that's a great general rule for basically every topic yeah. we discussed throughout this. Um, in terms of presentation, again, we covered this because you, you already got a chance to, to discuss your talk. Um, we framed this here in terms of talking about your dissertation for a new hire type of thing. Um, you were coming from a postdoc, so you already had recent research, um, how did you pick what to cover balancing scope and showing everything you've done versus specificity and focusing on what you think is your best work? How did you decide to go about that? Um, So I told a story. That's what you got to do. Your research, you have to tell a story as in particular, if you're going to be, if you're going to be talking to anyone that's not familiar with your field, you need to tell a story, you know, start to finish about how the projects unfolded, why you studied what you what you studied, why it's important in the first place. Uh, for me, my broad story revolves around hypoxia or lack of oxygen, uh, whether it's disease induced, like you and I have studied, Clark, did, looking at heart failure. Um, and through my postdoctoral work, it was looking at the influence of living at altitude with uh, in folks that have sickle cell anemia, um, so athletic diseases. So one of the main reasons I uh, one sought out a position here was because I'm looking up out the window right now at Mauna Kea, which is just shy of 14,000 feet, and I'm sitting at about sea level right here. So it, it, the environment itself is poised to do some really amazing uh, research. So I put together my presentation um, to, to tell that story, to express uh, what I'm interested in, why it's important, why the students should be interested in it, what they're going to gain from this type of work and working with me, 
and why University of Hawaii at Hilo is a perfect fit. Okay. So, so you kind of created a, you created a bit like a narrative arc, which you tend to do in science anyway, and, but you made sure that the university that you're applying to is a key part of that arc. So you sort of just set up your, your typical science narrative that you would do generally, and you made sure to include how the university and coming here is going to fit into that narrative. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's tell a story. Yeah. I think as a general rule, that's great because people can adapt that to whatever their research topic is, whether it's experimental or not, whatever field it is, um, create that arc, include the university within that arc, um, and make it sound good. Sell it. Perfect. Um, let's move on real quick. Um, so we talked, we got through the talk and move on from that. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about before we go into questions real quick, because I think we have some questions that want to just get into the nitty gritty of some, some details about your experience with, um, length, timing, these types of things. Um, in terms of, uh, when you're finishing up and, and the university, we've been talking about you selling yourself to them. Uh, let's talk about the other side, them selling to you and what you tried to do in order to sort of imply your expectations to them. Obviously there's a negotiation at a later stage, a hard negotiation where you're counter um, offer counter offer type thing. But what did you do while you were there to sort of give an indication of what you were expecting from them? Um, I got, so in my meeting with the uh, interim vice chancellor of academic affairs, uh, I was asked, you know, well, what do you need to do your research? And so I had a list prepared of stuff, you know, the <laughs> equipment and a number of, of, of money of, that I could get by on to, to uh, get my work done. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much uh, how I approached that. I, I uh, broached that topic both with the dean the dean more for space requirements because space is always an issue at institutions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to need a lab, you know, and the lab has to be climate control, which Hawaii is an issue because it's, it is nice. All, some of the buildings don't have air conditioning because it's so nice, but the humidity is high. So that was, that's a thing. I need to have a climate controlled building. So my equipment doesn't fall apart. Um, so yeah, ample space, uh, and ask, don't be afraid to ask them about this stuff. When you're talking to the administrators, the department heads, uh, they'll be candid. Like if the department head doesn't know, they'll tell you to talk to the dean. Uh, or if the dean doesn't know, they'll, they'll refer you up the chain. Uh, if they don't know, they should find an answer for you. And again, use all of this as a litmus, litmus test, a basic test to see uh, if this is going to fit for you. Because you don't want to come to a, a university setting, tenure track position, if you don't have tools you need to be successful uh, you'll be out in a couple of years once your initial contracts are do you think that helped you do you think you got a better first offer that you then so a better baseline first offer to negotiate off of because they saw you were prepared you came in with this list like you knew exactly what you would need you knew the challenges and you you had you had requirements um, you had already thought about it when you went out so when you came out to sell yourself you sold yourself and then you said, okay, to do all the stuff that I just sold you on, here's what I'm going to need. Do you think you got a better first offer and thus had to maybe do less negotiating um, after um, the interview stage? Yeah, absolutely. And we got, you know, I, I was lucky enough to, to have some great mentors. And so I had an idea. I had these thoughts that I've just expressed with you all um, beforehand. I've been told, you know, come with a number in mind. Um, and don't be afraid to talk the nitty gritty, the money, because that's at the end of the day, that's what's going to get you uh, on the, the train to success. Um, so absolutely. And, and the initial, once I, I heard I was going to get an offer, the Dean called me and asked me what type of number I had in mind for salary. Um, and I was able to have a, a, a reasonable number in mind because I'd done my research again. So I dove back in and for our university and, and many universities, in fact, the, the, the salaries across department and across colleges at different levels, academic rank are posted. So I knew the average salary for the college um, for an assistant professor. So I knew what I was worth and kind of had an idea of what to ask for. And 
knew what not to accept anything below. I had my own personal mm -hmm. threshold. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would say as far as the initial, uh, you know, discussions go. Yeah. Be candid. Be open with them. And I think it hurts your chances of getting the job if you don't, if you don't have a list. Like you came with a list. Um, you ask questions. I think it hurts your chances if you don't do that. Do you agree? Because if you don't ask those questions, it's like, well, he just sold us and all this stuff that he's going to be able to do. But then like, he didn't, he didn't like ask about whether the stuff's going to be in place for him to do that. So is he really um, a person that's capable of getting stuff done if, if um, he's not preparing in this way? So do you think it hurts to not ask that? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's something you have to gauge too. So for me, I, there's no preclinical facilities on this island. I have to go to the medical school uh, on Oahu, which is, you know, 35 minute airplane ride away to do that type of work. And most of my work to this point had been preclinical. So I had to, to make it or find a way to be very clear that I either need them to build a facility, which is not going to happen because of millions of dollars. Um, or I would need to find another way to do like clinical altitude related work on the island here or establish connections with the medical school. Um, so that lets them know that the gears are turning and that you're, mm -hmm. you're productive. And especially at this point, they really, what, what an administrator doesn't want to see happen is for somebody to get tenure and then become unproductive. That happens more often than it should. And so you want to ensure to them that you're thinking long term with regards to productivity and having that list helps you uh, convey that message. Yeah, like you said, they need to see that the gears are turning. That's a great way to put it. Um, by demonstrating that, I think you give yourself a leg up. A lot of people have ideas, but a lot, not a lot of people talk about the details to get to those ideas. And if you're if you demonstrate to them that you're already paying attention to those details before they even offer you the position. I think it's good for you. Okay. Um, we are just a, a couple minutes over an hour there. So we managed to get through it. I thought, I thought I was taking a little bit too long there, but we got finished up. So we have the Q and a session now. Um, AB has been monitoring this. So let me bring it up real quick. Okay, so we got about 14 open, so we're going to just go ahead and start at the top of the list. Uh, guys, again, feel free to um, upvote any ones that you like. Um, that way those will get moved to the top. I think we can get through most of these because I think a lot of them are very good, straightforward questions that we can give clear answers to. But uh, go ahead and upvote the ones that are the most concerned for you. Um, okay, so this first one here is kind of related to those logistics, Scott. So. Uh, the question we have is um, the attendee has an upcoming interview next week and he wants to postpone the interview um, for just one day. Would that be okay to email the person as a request or is that a bad impression? No, do it. Uh, it, it you know, it depends. If you have a valid reason that you really need to move it, um, yeah, by all means, ask them. And, but I would get it done now. Uh, it depends on where you're going. For me, like I, my logistics were – uh, set up for me like about three, four weeks before. It was probably three weeks before I actually did my interview. Um, so moving flights around is never fun. Um, and rescheduling all those, the interviews could be tricky as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's never a bad idea to ask questions. You, you always want to, you always want to err on the side of communication with these folks. Absolutely. But ask, ask very soon. Okay. Yeah. Get it done. <laughs> yeah. It's next okay. week. Yeah. As soon as you week. sign off, make sure you reach out to them. Just explain that it would fit the schedule better for you, allow you to give a better presentation. I think, I think it makes it hard for them to reject it when you say it in that sort of manner. Like, you know, this would make it so I can give a better quality presentation. It's, it's unlikely they'll say no, um, but they might have to say no. There might be scheduling reasons. So, but definitely you, it won't give a bad impression to ask. By any means. Um, moving on to the next one. Um, so how much does the employer uh, value your work experience? Um, I'm probably not getting all the gist of this question, so I apologize. Um, but PhDs have, coming from a PhD program perhaps, maybe you have 
experience, but it's sort of that quasi experience. So like your teaching experience is more lab based. Um, you're more of a teaching assistant rather than um, teaching full faculty lecture type things. Um, do you think that's problematic? Uh, what do you think you could do about that? Any opinion on that? Because I think that's common for most people coming from a PhD or postdoc, feeling like their experience counts, <laughs> but maybe yeah. it doesn't count as much. Yeah, you're always going to be scrutinized. Um, if it's your first faculty position, just be ready for it. That's what I was saying. You know, I have all this stuff on my CV that shows that I, you know, was a graduate teaching assistant. So I ran labs, and then I was also adjunct faculty when uh, when I was still at Kansas State as a senior level graduate student, as a doctoral student. So I was technically considered an instructor. So I have. I have that on the CV. So, I, and then I, when I was a postdoc, I also built a course and ran the course online um, for Kansas State University uh, for their graduate program. So, those are things you want to you want to make sure that come come through, and those that sh that all should be valued by the employer. Um, but again, it's, if it's your first faculty position, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna still wonder like, well, that's yeah. you know. As a but, position, it's different. But at the same time, if they if they're considering you as a candidate, they already know that, and so it, to my mind, they already understand your right. level of experience. And so the question isn't how does mine compare to maybe someone who's already held a faculty position. Ask yourself how does my experience teaching whatever. Um, how does that compare to other people in the same position? So me versus another candidate at my same level. Don't compare yourself because they've already looked, they've already compared you to everybody and decided you're okay, you're worth considering. So think about how you compare. Are you a super strong candidate in terms of that experience for your position, PhD, postdoc, whatever that may be? Keep that in mind in order to keep your confidence up, I think is a, a good approach. Right. Okay, um, this one's a little bit general, so I'm going to kind of reword it here. It's, it's what specific performance during the interview process will help you to get to the, get to the you know, final candidate position. Um, let's summarize that as what do you think is the most important? It's, it's obviously all important, but if you were, if, if I put you on the spot, what, what did you think was the most important thing for you when you went out for your interview? Um, fit. So fit with the institution and the department. Be yourself, bottom line. Be yourself in the video interview. Be yourself on the phone with them. Be yourself in the emails. Uh, don't try to paint a facade for somebody that you're not, right? Don't try to act different than you normally are. Uh, obviously, be professional. There's a, there's a casual me and there's a professional me. Mm -hmm. um, but I communicate the same way. Uh, with during my interview process as I do talking to my colleagues day to day, you know? Um, so that helps you ensure that the fit is what you, um, that, that you have a good understanding of the fit, put it that way. Perfect. Yeah. I think, um, the ultimate, ultimately people are picking the candidate to answer the overriding question of who do I want as my colleague? Right. right? <laughs> This person's yeah. going to be my colleague. So they try to be objective and say, like, who's the best candidate? Who's the best scientist? But ultimately, people vote on you based on, do I want them as a colleague? You're going to yeah. be a faculty member with them. So fit makes sense to me, complete sense, in terms of being the most important thing. OK, um, next one we have. Um, How, how do you answer questions? Like these are kind of common. So sometimes you get a stock question. I think it's less common in academia than it is in a business environment. But you get these stock questions like, uh, why do you think we should hire you? Um, have you had to deal with that question? And how, do you, how would you deal with it? Yeah, so during my, I got those types of questions during the video interview. Um, they, have, they all had like a list of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Each faculty member read one. Uh, one was related to like, how do you, uh, do you have any experience teaching in a rural environment? Um, because Hilo is a small town. So, you know, real specific questions like that to see if I was a fit, but it, it kind of comes back to why do you think we should hire? Why are you a strong candidate? 
you need to hit it just quickly emphasize some bullet points you know i have a, a strong background in cardiopulmonary physiology um, there's a you know i see that there's a need for that in your department um i've identified that i can work with you know doctors a b and g uh, mm -hmm. so that we can get get a head start and get the ball ball rolling with grants um in research um i really uh, am excited to uh, get back into teaching and that's a huge thing that you value in the department so things like that um you're you're re-emphasizing in a bullet point matter why you're a good fit for the institution and the institution's mm -hmm. needs yeah i like that bullet pointing your strength so if you get those type of questions um, for our attendee that asked that one whenever you get that exact question or a similar one like that these sort of like um rehearsed template questions bullet point your strengths that's a great approach i think to it that's the easiest one to do on the spot um, and remember when they ask you those questions they're really just excuses to get you to talk they're sort of like prompts to get you to talk a bit more so don't freeze up just bullet point your answers and then start and then start elaborating yeah that's a perfect approach i think yeah and you can come back to it too and just say does that answer your question and if it does they'll say yeah most time they'll say yeah sometimes we're like well kind of you know but then you know okay what did, what did, what else do you want to know you know things like yeah. that for for me yeah. i personally don't i don't like those questions no. uh, when i interview <laughs> when i interview people because the reason is you want them to to share more i just right. ask them to share more so i tend to have it i don't really like those questions but you are gonna have to deal with them it's a very common interview strategy so just keep in mind why they're asking you those questions spit out some quick bullet points so that you're not just frozen with no answer, then elaborate, because that's really what they're trying to get you to do. Um, so we talked about this a little bit. Um, what, what's the committee's primary focus? Publication, future research, um, collaboration with PIs. I think it really just varies depending, like you were mentioning, whether it's teaching or research emphasis. So figure out, figure out what the emphasis is on there, what your role is supposed to be, and that's going to give you insight into whether they care more about your publication record, um, your future research in your talk, any of that type of thing. So that, that's just going to be dependent, I think, where you go. Would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, there's some folks in the department that don't care anything about publications. So that's different than in med school. So it just, yeah, it's going to be very entirely based on where you're trying to yeah. go. And you know what you can do is just ask. So you don't necessarily have to ask what's yep. your, your biggest focus, but a, a question I think is a good one from a candidate is, is what are you most concerned about in your new hire? That's a great question, I think, to ask. Um, yeah, who's your shows, ideal candidate? Yeah, it shows insight on your part to ask that question, and then it gives you the answer to this question that our attendee just asked, which I think is, a, is the big question. What do yeah. you care about most? Ask them. Ask them what they're most concerned about in a candidate, and that'll give you some information. And if you ask it early on, then you have the entire rest of your trip, the rest of your interview, to keep that in the back of your head and make your comments geared around that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Perfect. Okay, we're getting uh, close here on the last of the questions. Um, this is a very, this is a great one, and this is something. This is why I was trying to encourage non-English speakers to ask questions, not be concerned. Um, the concern here is for people not from an English speaking country, um, non-native English speakers, the interview is obviously it's the most difficult and it's extremely stressful, right? It's, it's extremely stressful for you and I and we're native English speakers. Yep. I can't imagine how difficult it is for others. Um, so in terms of questions, is there a way to prepare for questions that you might receive? Um, are there commonly asked questions? Um, what, what sort of advice would you give to non-English speakers who are fretting about the, the interview portion? Um, I mean, common, common questions will be, uh, at least in my field, is it going to be revolving around your research and your teaching and your potential service to the community? That's a big thing here, too, is community outreach. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you should, you should have some uh, ways to effectively communicate the goals of your research agenda, uh, as well as some of the techniques that you use to teach, uh, if that's what your department focuses on. Um, and then 
as well as some of the ways that you can benefit the community. Um, that's what I would probably yeah. say are three things I would prepare for. Okay. Yeah, I think um, sort of having long form answers for your what you put on your CV, your research statement, your teaching statement, have long form versions of those. So those are normally short on your CV, but have something you can elaborate on. Really be able to elaborate on your entire CV. Anything that you have in your CV, be prepared to answer a question about yeah, that. That's good. That's a good rule. Um, yeah. Other than that, I think we've covered some common questions, so uh, just keep those in mind. But don't be concerned if you're if you're not a native English speaker. They brought you there. Like they're already past that, and no, right. it's it's not going to reflect poorly or anything. You just got to be confident and not worry about it. I know it's easy to say that, but trust me, you're never going to give a bad impression. And when you demonstrate enthusiasm for your science as a non-English speaker, I think that comes through. And that's the one thing that sort of leaps the language barrier is being passionate about your science and trying to communicate um, what you're interested in, what your research is about. Yep. Um, one second. So, okay, I love this question. Um, so this person wants tips for meeting with students. How do you present yourself to the students? We talked about that a little bit, um, but what's your approach? You were a grad student, you remember it. It wasn't too awful long ago. Um, what, do grad, what do students want to hear from a potential faculty hire? Yeah, just you want to be, the way I look at it is I try to be the faculty member that I wish I would have had. Uh, we lucked out, both uh, Clark and I did, because we had great mentors and great environment to go to school in, um, great professors. So I try to emulate them uh, uh, as much as I could, and and uh, yeah, I mean that's that's ultimately what you're what you're looking to do is develop a relationship with the students um, and and make yourself approachable. So just remember what it was like to be a student. Um, and you know, sometimes you have a unapproachable faculty member, and other times you have faculty members that are like, no, oh, you know, these guys are these guys are not so bad. You know, they're they're similar to me. And, you know, so for me, I, I bring it back down to to their level. As an early student, I was awful. I I tell this story every semester to my my students, but my first semester as an undergraduate, I almost flunked out. Um, I didn't do well. I, I, I always struggled with exams up through even through our doctoral work in the in the uh, uh, exam portion, standardized tests. It was just taking exams was never my thing. Um, I could write and communicate science like crazy. Uh, I knew my stuff, but yeah, it, it was always a challenge. So letting them know that what they're experiencing is something that you've been through as well will also sort of bring that barrier down. And uh, to me, that's what impresses students. Yeah. yeah. Coming from a place of empathy, I think is always key and doubly so with students. So if you're looking to impress students, try to be empathetic, try to remember when you were a student, which like you said, Scott, what you would want to hear from a faculty member, put yourself in their shoes. Um, I think another thing to keep in mind, particularly if there's a research um, component, um, if there's a graduate program there, um, indicate your philosophy on mentoring so make sure you share with them your beliefs and mentoring so they understand that you care about that process, that you care about how um, you mentor your students. And also emphasize to them that there's gonna be a lot of opportunity. So if you are running a lab, um, emphasize that you as a faculty hire, there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for grad students to do some really interesting things um, to accomplish some very interesting things. I think those are a couple that can help you as well. Um, I'm sorry if we're brief with the last few questions, but we don't want to keep you here for too long. So, um, okay. In terms of how do they evaluate the quality of your research accomplishments? We know that we know that overall your CV is going to vary in how it's judged depending on um, an emphasis on teaching, like you, you were mentioning for your ex recent experience or an emphasis for research. Um, I think one concern, a lot of international scientists have is how might, in particular for Western or US-based institutes, how do they judge your research quality? 
because I think it's a little bit different than the international scope where there's still a, a very heavy emphasis on H index, impact factor, the journals you publish in, this type of thing. Um, in the US, I think it's less of a concern now. You still have to have a robust record, but they're not simply, um, they're not simply looking for if you have a nature paper or something like that. Would you agree? Yeah, it, it depends. Um, you know, so I've been scrutinized before with grant reviews. So they look at you as an applicant and usually I scored very high. And if I, if I didn't score high on something, it would be a, a comment, old school comment like that, like needs, needs like a publication in a major journal. So, but I agree. I think that's kind of fallen by the wayside there. People citing your work is probably more important than the journals that you're actually publishing in. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's... It's that's, still important. Um, a robust record, which I think means a good number of publications I, on a topic that's pertinent. Um, yeah. And also, I think, if anything, faculty positions, now they're a bit more interested in your grants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sort that, of that's what I was going to say. Yeah, so. that's what I was going to hit on, too, is the grants or it's money. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I told, told you earlier that I applied to another position earlier, uh, didn't get shortlisted and inquired why, and it was grants. I was, I was a bit more junior at that point. I'd only been at postdoc for about a year. Um, but the institution, particularly if, if your salary is reliant partially on grants or you have a set amount of time before it does start to rely on grants, they want to know that you have the ability to bring money in. So yes. that's, that's a huge part of the reason. Yeah. So maybe if you are in like a postdoc situation or something and trying to decide if you're ready or not, um, if you're worried about your publication record or something, you're worried about whether your CV is robust enough at this point, consider that maybe your maybe the threshold you need to cross is securing a grant rather than worrying about a nature paper, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. If, you, if you're trying to prioritize, if you're trying to do that last thing to get you re yourself ready, you don't think you're ready yet, um, maybe focus on that direction because that's, the, I think, a big concern. Yeah, they don't have to be like R01s or like, you know, massive grants. Apply yeah. for pilot funding. There's pilot grants all over the place for $20,000 or $50,000, and that's really helpful. It shows you know how to write a grant. If exactly. you've written a successful grant. It doesn't have to be huge, but just that you've written a grant and it's got accepted. I think that's yeah. crucial. Perfect. Um, another one we have here is so... Is it appropriate to contact faculty members prior to the interview for some like pre-discussion? Um, the our attendees a little bit concerned that that might come across as like you know trying to get it, sort of trying to like cheat a little bit, like uh, getting some information beforehand. Is it okay? And if so, like how is it okay to do that? What, what approach would you take? If you're doing that? No, I don't think it's cheating. I can understand why people might get miffed about it, but what just I mean. I didn't have any problem doing that to some degree with, with my interview here. I reached out to, in the first place, verify I could work with somebody there and that it was even worth applying to. So in a way, you're kind of already doing that in the beginning. So at least follow what we've recommended you do in this webinar. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, if they're, if they're not privy to it and they're saying, oh, I can't talk to you, then don't push the subject. But um, there's there's no problem trying to figure out if, if that's somebody you could work with. And in particular, after the interview, even if you don't get the job, I mean, you've made, you've established relationships to potentially collaborate with these folks and who knows down the road, it may be a fit later on, you know, maybe things change and, you know, who knows? So yeah, I would definitely not. Yes. Yeah. If you reach out, I suggest specific questions. Don't ask them for like tips on the interview. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> ask them a very specific detailed question that you're trying to fact find so you can prepare better. Um, okay, AB is telling me that we're we're getting close to 90 minutes, so she's telling me I'm I'm sort of out of time. So let let me just, if you don't mind, Scott, I'm just going to try to address these last couple real quick. Um, the one is how to demonstrate teaching potential. Um, I think it's actually. If you're concerned about that and you think that's that's something that they're concerned about and they don't have it set up for you to give a lecture or a teaching demo, just ask them to do that. I think that's a great approach. Just say, um, I want to demonstrate my um, teaching ability, my philosophy for you. Um, can, 
can I guess lecture or do something during the interview process so that you can properly evaluate me? I think that's the best way to do it. That's a very straightforward way. Um, and then there's a final question about email tone. Um, I'm actually going to direct you to the Left Hub site. A lot of the concerns for, um, in particular, non English speakers um, related to tone, um, how to address um, things in email correspondence, I think actually is very similar to how we talk about dealing with tone in your email correspondence with journals. So if you go to um, our Left Hub Learning Nexus, um, you can go in and find how to deal with response letters and how to deal with tone and etiquette and email. And there's some very, very specific examples in there. Um, if we had more time, I could go over those. But go ahead and I think just with that resource, you can get um, most of your answer to that. Also, that's another thing to just ask colleagues. Don't be afraid to reach out to a colleague, um, even someone that you don't know very well, if you want to have that sort of discussion on what you think is proper tone and etiquette with email correspondence. Again, um, in, uh, native English speakers are happy to sort of help you with that type of issue. Okay, and I'm gonna wrap us up there. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, go ahead, Scott. <laughs> I wanted to get this in there. So not a whole lot of people are gonna tell you this, but one thing that was I was told uh, by our mentor, uh, Clark and my mentor is, don't accept the first offer they give you, okay? So if they've brought you out, they've paid for your flights, they've shortlisted you, they've already spent a lot of money and a lot of time trying to bring you out uh, for this interview process. Uh, that first offer they give you often can be better. And if it can't, they'll tell you. So uh, my piece of final piece of advice, a lot of times don't accept that, that first offer. Uh, try, to, try to get a little bit more time, protected time with your, your research, you know, a little bit less teaching load to begin with, a little bit higher salary. All these things are, are, are things I would suggest trying to get more of on that first, uh, first offer, right? So you're not going to offend them. Uh, they, they will uh, tell you if they can't do it or if they can do it. Uh, they'll try to make it work. It may take more time, but ultimately it will, it will be better for you. Perfect. All righty. Well, um, one thing I want to do is uh, remind you that this is on demand. So you can come back if um, you want to review this, um, you want to share it, um, you can go ahead and, and revisit. Um, you just go ahead and you can download this entire file and you'll have the recording to use uh, for yourself. Um, I would definitely like to thank you, Scott. I really appreciate you trying to take the time out of your day. I know it's mid afternoon for you there um, in the middle of a busy work day. So um, I appreciate you taking the time to come answer these questions. Um, it looks like we garnered substantial interest, so potentially in the future we may have a follow-up. Um, there's plenty of other topics that I know you're well-versed on, so we might be bringing you back um, as a guest speaker in the future, but I thank you for coming out for this one. Um, to all you who uh, follow our webinars, our next uh, webinar should be the, the usual time that it is. It should be um, mid-month next month, so look for an announcement. Um, if you're on our email list, you'll get an email for it to register. Um, if not, you can go to the Left Hub site. It's on our journal selector tool. We'll have an announcement um, for the next topic and the next um, date and time. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Scott, um, for sharing your knowledge and experience. Uh, we really appreciate it. All right, you all have a good day. Uh, appreciate you attending.